Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Making Money Matter. I'm your host, Kerry Stevenson, and I've asked Simon Hunt from Simon Hunt Strategic Services to come join us. Why? Well, the last time Simon and I spoke, which was approximately six, seven months ago, I got a flurry of comments from you all saying, could I please have him back on every month? Or at least some of you said every week. Well, both Simon and I speaking off camera said, we could not believe where this year has gone, and we're now already in August. And Simon does a lot of research. He's a deep economic thinker. You can find his information, subscribe to his service, Simon Hunt Strategic Services, at simon-hunt.com. Now, we're going to get into a lot of information today because things around the world are getting interesting. I'm going to let Simon do most of the talking, but... For those of you that are looking at the news at the moment, right now, as I speak to you today, coming up to the second week of August, it says that the US is scrambling as the threat of a major attack looms. It's sending more high-powered military resources to the Middle East as tensions threaten to escalate into open conflict, something that Simon and I spoke about last time but they say, the US is saying that they are prepared to step in to defend Israel from a looming attack by Iran. So things are hotting up, not just there, but we know that in Europe, things are a little bit interesting as well. In the UK, uh, the, the crisis in the UK seems to social unrest is beginning to come out of control. Here in Australia, we're a little bit protected from that, but we have our own challenges. But Simon, thank you so much for coming back on. Your deep understanding of the global threats, I guess, and uh, last time we spoke, you said we will have rolling recessions in 2025. And I have lots of questions for you, but first of all, welcome back. Good to see you. Well, thank you very much for having me back. Um... Uh, let me start. I'm in the process of writing a an in-depth report on what is going on. So I thought I would read out the introduction, as that really sets the scene for what we're going to talk about. Perfect. So here goes. The real war that is starting to unfold is not only between NATO and Russia and Israel and Iran. It is about control of the world. For the Western alliance led by America, the emergence of a new world order under the umbrella of the BRICS group of nations, led by Russia and China, poses a threat to America's ability to manage the world order for its own benefits. As the BRICS group of nations expands its membership to include commodity producing countries, whether oil, gas, agricultural products, or metals, <clears throat> the assets at the bottom of the Western world's financial pyramid diminishes, leaving only a few trillion of physical assets to support a financial debt pyramid <clears throat> of around $280 trillion, and that excludes China. What is emerging is not just a war between countries, but a war on which to increase the asset base of the Western alliance. In a nutshell, the real war is about the survival of the American-led Western alliance and about its financial empire versus the commodity assets of the BRICS group of nations. The drivers behind this war are not who is in the White House, but the group behind the throne who pull the levers of power. They understand that their ability to control events will be gone should Trump emerge as president. Their objective, <clears throat> long held, is to dismember Russia and thus gain control of the country's huge national resources. As Halford Mackinder remarked in 1904, who controls the heartland controls the world. Thus US, thus, U.S. politics is very much a part of the escalations, as this powerful group will do anything and everything to prevent Trump 
from getting into the White House. Escalation of wars is occurring at a time when the Western world's economy has begun turning down, probably into recession, and when there are reported fragile structures within its financial system. Wars are inflationary and disruptive to supply chains. If wars do expand over existing borders, <clears throat> global inflation, and America's as well, will soar into double-digit fig figures. Wow. What then will 10-year U.S. Treasuries be yielding? Not 4%, but more likely double-digit numbers by the end of 2027. So that sets the background as to what we can talk about today. It's control of the world with the US not wishing to give up the power that it's had for so long. It's almost like the axis is moving, but can it, can it be stopped? That's exactly what the war is all of the wars are all about. Yeah. So my question is, can it be stopped? And at what and at what price will they try to hold on? Uh, let's start with the war over Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That war is not really a war between Ukraine and Russia. It is NATO's footstep into Russia. So far, <clears throat> despite Ukraine being fully armed by NATO, mostly America, Putin's responses have been very careful and considerate. The problem now is that with the attacks being launched by Ukraine, with the full support of NATO, including America, into Russia itself is raising a very serious red line for the Kremlin. And in particular, in the recent days, the, the incursion into the Kursk Oblast by around a thousand Ukrainian and NATO troops with a rear guard force of maybe 10 to 15,000 of Ukrainians, NATO, paramilitary forces, etc., fully supported by NATO's equipment. How is <clears throat> how is Putin going to respond? Mm. His um, reticence to retaliate is seen by many in the West, many leaders in the West, as a sign of weakness. It's not. But in the Security Council, he is now under severe pressure to retaliate strongly. I should add also that there have been two assassination attempts on his life, which just increases the pressure on him to respond. How will he respond? Obviously, nobody knows other than himself and a very small group around him. But it could include <clears throat> a 
very strong attack using hypersonic missiles on a European country, maybe Kiev, who knows. It could include <clears throat> an attack on all NATO bases in Ukraine and surrounding countries. It could even, as suggested by a colleague of mine, include a tactical missile attack somewhere, followed by a statement, any further incursions into Russia will be met likewise. Or finally, it could be a cyber attack on a European city that shuts everything down. Mm. So I think, <clears throat> A retaliation is very likely before the end of September. That's in Europe. Simon, just, just to, to understand it a little bit more, this has been going on for a couple of years now. What, why has, didn't Putin do the hard line earlier? Why has he left it to fester, if you like, for this long. I would have thought that, you know, someone like himself would have just turned around or was he expecting it to resolve itself? It just seems to be, he seems to be sitting back. I mean, you know, there's a bit here and a bit there, but there's been no sort of, right, I'm done. <clears throat> he has not wanted to retaliate strongly. His objective all along has been to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Ukrainians are Slav people, so there is a brotherhood. But he he sees very clearly that. The powers that, the forces that wield power behind the White House are intent as part of a long-term objective to dismember Russia, to gain control of Russia's massive natural resources. It's been this group's objective for decades now, with the risk that Trump gets into the White House, they see that should he get into the White House, then that their long-held objectives are going to be destroyed. So, number one, they will do anything and everything to stop him getting into the White House. And secondly, these people are trying to force Russia to retaliate so that they can accuse Russia of starting a war. Right. So the question is, Putin knowing what that they will be attacked at some stage, he's already been planning it, building prefab hospitals across the country, had tactical nuclear exercises, has rebuilt the military, he's ready for a war. Wow. So and the then if you look at the other side, because this is important, hmm. we go back to knowing that in early May, NATO 
held a meeting in a Baltic state attended by government representatives at which NATO informed the government reps we are planning a war against Russia. Since then, or probably preceding that statement, hundreds of thousands of NATO troops have been located in countries surrounding Russia, yep. as well as massive uh, train loads of military equipment going into Poland, as well as apparently a division of the UK's Air Force. So the planning has been there for some time. Putin knows it. So it's who true? Who pulls the trigger first? Mm -hmm. But the trigger is going to be pulled for political reasons. And if I'm if I'm right in in listening, Putin doesn't want to be the first person to pull the trigger because if he does, no. he's seen as the bad guy. So he wants someone else to pull the trigger. And then he says, "I'm here just protecting." But but he is probably under great pressure. Mm -hmm in the Security Council to be the first to pull the trigger. We don't know yet. We don't know that. All I'm saying is that they are fully prepared, knowing that NATO plans to attack Russia. And Simon, I know you were you were planning to come out and uh, and to give a talk, which I was really keen to hear from you, and that's why I'm getting you on the channel now because you are coming out to give something very similar to this at our Australian Gold Conference. And we'll get into gold in a in a little while in this conversation because I think that does play into it as well. Sure. Um, sure. But but you you said last time that you know you thought that towards the end of this year and now. It's sort of almost upon us, and you're saying, "Look, now is not the time for me to be traveling away from where you are, which is D Dubai." Um, you feel like it is. I mean, it feels to me like it, the, the 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 water is boiling, and it's not long before the lid comes off. Are you feeling that? Uh, definitely. Um, uh, I mean, we've only spoken about Europe. But the situation is no calmer in the Middle East. Um, I think that either or both wars in um, the wars will escalate in Europe and in the Middle East before the end of September. Oh, wow. And possibly before the end of this month. Is that because they want to get all this before the US? Because we, I mean, I know, guys, I know I sound like very methodical and I'm not taking this seriously. I am, but I just want to figure out what's the true agenda. And Simon, is this all arcing up now because we've got the US election in November? We've got to, we've got to get this sort of before the, it does, does that have any correlation to what's going on at the moment? To, in, in terms yeah, it has a very, it has a very big correlation. Um, you can argue, or some argue, some analysts argue, that if you have a war, you have a sitting president. Mm -hmm. Now, how will that happen, given that Biden has already announced he's not going to run? But what if, and it's a what if, not a forecast, that at the Democrat convention, Biden resigns there and then, and therefore Harris becomes the president? I think that's a highly likely possibility. So, again, it's immaterial who's in the White House, because who's in, who is in the White House does not really pull the levers of power. Mm -hmm. It's the guys behind it. 
old and new family money. It's all a money, wars are a money game. Talk to me about that. Talk to us about that. Wars are a money game. I mean, I know you can get distracted by wars and wars cost a lot of money, but when you say war is a money game, it's an interesting... Well, go back in history, mm -hmm. how a certain French family um, always backed both sides and managed to, to win profitably. It's... Who is who are the big powers behind the Davos crowd? Yeah. Who want to make us all subservient to so that we have no money and we're happy. Yes, you will own nothing and you will be happy, says Klaus. That's right. <laughs> so it's the same crowd. Okay. This is he who controls the money, controls the world, but more importantly, he who controls the resources, the commodities, controls the world as well, and Russia being very resource-rich. Australia, by the way, being very resource-rich as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and China is resource-rich, but also resource-dependent because of the, you know, the, the size of the population. My audience out there will be saying, okay, this all sounds a little bit scary. What can we do? at the moment to not only protect ourselves, but but moving forward. I mean, you can't ignore the fact that social unrest, tensions, as you said, we haven't even touched the, the war in the Middle East at the moment. We will get onto that. But what would you say to people that are watching this right now that they should be doing? I mean, I know or I feel like in times of war, something like gold is not a bad place to be and you said <clears throat> wars are in place. I think there are um, two primary assets that one needs for survival. The first, you don't want to be owning a fiat currency apart from having sufficient for day-to-day -day needs, your security should be in gold. You should also have access to food. Um, whether that access is farmland or stocks of food in your own home. In a war scenario, may apply less to Australia, but who knows? But in a war scenario, you're going to have supply chain disruptions And you're going to have food shortages. Food prices are going to soar. They already I have friends. Soar. <laughs> I said soar, yeah. <clears throat> I have friends who have acquired from China self-generating sets powered by folding solar panels that can run your home's electricity, refrigerators, water supply, power, everything. That's part of their survival kit. So... Simon, what would you say to people that are listening right now that say, oh, don't be ridiculous, it's never going to get to that? Um, because uh, I, I've heard people say this, you know, this this whole sort of, oh, we're going to, you know, have supply chain issues and the war is coming and you're not going to have food. I can hear them already out there saying, oh, that's crazy talk, we're never going to get there. What would you say to those people? 
Um, <laughs> well, first of all, we've not had a major war for near on 80 years. Yeah. So uh, people have, most people have not lived through a serious war period. True. Um, secondly, we have to understand the dynamics of America and its total desire to continue to dominate the world. And there is the other group who, who say, sorry, we don't want to be bullied by you anymore. You not only use your military power, you use your currency to achieve your objectives at our expenses. I mean, let me let me quote you some interesting statistics. A dollar, a 1970 dollar, is now worth 12 cents. A 1980 dollar, 23 cents. A 1990 dollar, 39 cents. Wow. A 2000 dollar, 53 cents. A 2010 dollar, 68 cents. And even a 2020 dollar, 81 cents. Wow. Think of, in real money terms, people talk about, oh, we've made super profits. In real money terms, come on, practically nothing. This is so, what. So explain that. Talk to me like a five year old when you when you say that. Are you saying that inflation is making the costs of goods and services go through the roof, and therefore the value of a dollar means it so goes much down. It goes. It goes down basically every decade, as right. I've explained. Yeah. And even in four years, it's gone down nearly twenty, nearly twenty cents. Which is interesting because I was showing someone the price of the Australian dollar versus gold, and it's it's not the gold price that has changed in value. It's the fact that the Australian dollar has lost purchasing power of weight for it. Exactly, exactly. Twenty five percent in twelve months, and I know <laughs> none of you believe me, but I'm telling you right now: go to goldprice.org, check it out for yourself. Look at the charts. Look at the Australian dollar versus gold, 25% in one year. Uh, I think it's about 12% in six months. And I can go back, Simon, I can go back 20 years and show them that. But people still worry. You, you can use simple things like a, 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 a tailored suit priced mm -hmm. in gold. It's the same price 50 years ago as today. So why is there such a disconnect between the majority of people out there? Because very few people, if you look at it from a percentage point of view, very, very, very few people, first of all, understand it or even care about it. I was talking to someone the other day and they they, they literally poo pooed me and said, I'm not interested in gold. Like, just dismiss it. Why is there such a disconnect when it is so obvious that, you know, hard assets are getting pricier against paper currency. Why is there a disconnect? Oh. You should ask them, how much has their weekly wholesale shopping gone up by? Mm. I mean, that's why, going back to America, why the... the um, Michigan Confidence Survey, the last one, was appalling. The confidence has dropped like a stone. Why? Because they, they, they know how much real inflation is. It's not the reported CPI data. That's Martha Burns in the 1970s when he didn't want to raise interest rates, started manipulating the CPI data 
And virtually every administration since then has done the same thing. There's a guy called John Williams of Shadow Government Stats that has actually taken all, all of those manipulations since the 1970s out of the system. And it shows that what is, that, what is inflation is running at double digit figures. Today, wow! What a household! What a households see same thing. So the disconnect is between real life and what the government tells you. And I guess that comes down to the fact we're talking about disconnect. The fact of the matter is that everybody is turning around and they go, "Well, I trust the government." Government's here to but say, start, but but now they're starting not to trust the government. Hmm. Ask the questions. Look at what's going on in America. Look at what's going on in Europe. It's interesting that throughout history, revolutions in Europe have started by the peasants or the farmers, who started the recent uprisings. The farmers because they were, excuse my language, pissed off with what Brussels was telling them what to do. Mm. And, and in the UK, my country of birth, the situation has got totally out of hand. Yeah, awful. I am told reliably that we will soon see the military on the streets. Holy moly, really? And that we will probably see a national government. Goodness me. It's got that bad. Yeah. I mean, I read in today's Telegraph or Times, I can't remember, that in Leicester Square, yeah. a young girl... Yeah. Stabbed, stabbed, and stabbed. This is the West End. I know, I read it. Shocking. Yeah. Leicester Square, right in the heart of the city, the West End, where you, you should feel safe. Yeah. yeah. And even in sleepy Surrey, where I used to live, in a village not too far away, same thing. Young girl stabbed. What? What? Why? What is it? Is it because people are? Is it? Is it the disconnect between the haves and the have-nots, and therefore people are getting angry? I mean, what's what is the reason for this happening more and more and getting more crazy right now? I. We've got two issues here. The first is why are people trying to kill each other? Mm -hmm. Is it because of immigration? And then you have people rebelling against the government not supporting law and order, but supporting, but supporting What do you call it? Um, supporting the criminals more supporting, than they're supporting... Supporting the bad guys. And supporting the criminals more than they are the victims. And the yeah, same yeah, yeah, yeah. Happening. Thank you. You've answered the question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the same is happening here in Australia, where the, the victims seem to just have to be able to get on with it and the criminals get a slap on the wrist and off you go. So I think uh, there is, there is a, a lot of pushback now from people saying... Yeah. They've had enough. Now, yeah. this sort of thing doesn't happen in Singapore. Like, Singapore is a lot safer, but I think some of the Western countries have just allowed. That's because the whole foundation of Singapore was built on law and order. Correct. And I have to say it is the same here in Dubai. Right. Very safe place to live. 
law and order like Singapore is paramount. You break the law, there's a lot of desert. <laughs> you don't need jails. Not much desert in Singapore then, <laughs> just quiet. No. But a lot of very overcrowded jail cells. Now, look, it's not a laughing matter. And I do want to get back to the crux of our conversation, which is um, about what's what's happening with the control of the world it, and, and where we are talking, as I said, second week of August, things seem to be getting a little bit tricky. That's a kind word for it at the moment. Is all of this inevitable? And what I want to, why, why I asked that question is, I said just before that some people will say, oh, don't let's go down that rabbit hole, it will never happen. But I want our audience, beautiful audience, my subscribers, to be able to understand that, you know, like a girl guide or a boy scout, just being prepared and understanding. And look, guys, we're not here to cause uh, mayhem, but if the facts are there and Simon understands and has been doing a deep dive into all of this, then it's time to sit up and pay attention. So my question, Simon, is, is this inevitable? Nothing is inevitable, but on the risk profile, the risk of <clears throat> the war escalating between NATO and Russia <clears throat> and between Israel supported by America and probably the UK versus, well, basically, Israel's survivability is at stake. Mm -hmm. So they will do anything to defend their country. Yep. They see as their enemies Hamas, Hezbollah, Yemen, and Iran. Mm -hmm. They see Iran as being the head of the snake. Okay. And when Netanyahu went to Washington just recently, he de facto got the support of Washington to not only to try to obliterate Hezbollah, but to inflict serious damage on Iran. Wow. Um, he made a statement, so I was told quite recently, there will be, in effect, saying there will be large swathes of Iran that will be uninhabitable. Which, to a simple guy like me, infers that they are planning a tactical missile attack. Iran has to make a retaliation following the attack in Tehran, only 800 meters from the president's palace in assassinating the Hamas leader. Mm -hmm. They are, they know that their retaliation will be met by a retaliation and it can be one retaliation after another. So they are preparing their defenses. Cargo plane loads of sophisticated equipment and S-400s by ship are coming in from Russia. And for all I know, from China as well. So an attack 
by Israel, stroke America, stroke UK, on Iran, is also going to be an attack on BRICS. Let me expand on that. It is very likely that Saudi will grant Israel permission to overfly their airspace in order to attack Iran. Oh, wow. That's not confirmed, but it's very likely. Just as it's very likely that the UAE will grant America permission to overfly the UAE from the fighters in America's aircraft carrier, which is in the Arabian Seas now. So the question I, I am posing, does all this mean this is not just a regional war, it's a global war, because you are attacking BRICS countries, and two new members of BRICS of saying, uh-uh, uh-uh, I think I'd better side with America. Which, so, which sounds to me like there could be some issues surrounding the BRICS. Huge issues. I mean, for instance, I mean, if it plays out as I've suggested, and that's not a forecast yet, but it's a high, high risk, is one repercussion is that the broker deal which China did to mend fences between Iran and Saudi will be fractured. Yeah. Yep. And just as MBS and Putin had a very close relationship, particularly over oil prices, is that fractured too? Mm -hmm. So there are immense consequences. Should either Israel attack Iran first or Iran attacks Israel first? Does it matter? Either way. Well, if Israel straight stroke uh, of America attacks Iran. I think you will find that Iran will take out the military bases that America has in the Middle East with hypersonic missiles. What happens also to Saudi oil fields? Mm. Will there be a calibrated attack by the Houthis the who have been rearmed with more sophisticated missiles? Mm -hmm. So, again, I'm setting out the risks, some of which will materialize. It comes back to your question, is this inevitable? I think it is very likely. If I was giving odds, I'd say it's worse than even money. Well, that's pretty scary to, to, to and, and you know, if you talk about Iran, well, Iran, all they've got to do, because you talked about global supply chain and people, you know, just be aware that global uh, supply chains can be erupted. I mean, if Iran gets attacked, they, all they have to do is shut down the Hormo Straits. Well, they've, they've already mined it. So it's just the click of a switch. And it's gone. Yeah. 
And the same with the Houthis, because they can shut down the Red Sea. Is that right? Yes, yeah. So that's another key. And, ev and even bomb Saudi oil fields. Gosh, it's a... It's a. It's a. Now pretty... again, I said this. The, these are the risks that will unfold if there is an attack on Iran. And Israel has already stated that any attack that Iran makes on Israel, there will be a strong retaliation. And it can can work a different way. Israel, with the full backing of the cabinet and most of the population, are determined to obliterate Hezbollah. Mm. The Lebanese government has just announced that he Hezbollah is now part of the Lebanese government's military. Oh, my goodness. Didn't know that. Yes. Wow. And you attack Hezbollah, you attack Syria. Hmm. And other than the odd bombings, which have been quite serious, but if there is a concerted attack on Syria, that brings Russia in and it brings Iran in. Well, so the retaliation can 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 work indirectly and not directly. And is this the catalyst for what you said in the past, which is that markets could fall by a further forty percent? Is that is that something that yes could happen? Yes. And I can illustrate that by showing some slides from our technical associate with whom we've worked for about 30 years successfully. So you will see the first one is the SNP. We have this big fall followed by the inflation takeoff and then you get the big crack in about 2026, 2027. And the second one is the FANGS index. Same, same thing. Then we get uh, the Nikkei. And I'm showing the Nikkei <clears throat> because of the yen carry trade which is starting to be unwound yeah same story and then we get what i think is the mother of them all which is the 10-year u.s uh, treasury yield which then gives us the deep recession stroke depression starting around 2027 and finally, what does this mean for metals? Showing copper. Is that the one? Yep. There's the copper. Yep. So we see from around 9,000 down to 6,000, then up to close to 14,000. So the bottom line is expect big corrections starting any time now, going into the early months of next year, by when central banks and governments will be throwing everything into the markets, which will lead to an inflation takeoff made worse by oil prices probably next year in 2026. 150, 200, and food prices soaring. And I hate to just bring it right back, but, you know, um, I, I needed to ask this question and we're running out of time. The question is, we've got a gold conference coming up in a couple of weeks' time. 
I hate to say is this going to be good for the gold mines, but you know the the the, the gold price is is strengthening. You said before that one of the things you feel that people should own is gold in this tense and muddled world. Um, is that physical gold or, or exposure to the gold mine? I would only, yes, personally, I would only buy physical gold. Okay. I don't trust the financial markets. Right. Okay. That's fair enough. I only trust the physical metal. I love that. Simon, I'm going to leave the last word to you. This has been a really fascinating look at what's going on, and I hope you all paid attention, ladies and gentlemen. You probably need to go and watch this a couple of times to take it all in. But we are living, as the Chinese would say, in very interesting times, if not fractious and quite frightening times. And as Simon said just before, the inflation number is a lot higher than any, any government is prepared to let, let you know about. So you have to do your own homework, you have to do your own research, and you have to protect your own wealth. It's very important. Simon, the last final word goes to you. What would you say to my beautiful audience out there, the best things that they can do right now? Give us three. Just three. Uh, plan, plan for survival. Make sure you've got food, water, enough money to pay for the daily necessities. Otherwise, the rest of your, most of the rest of your portfolio, hold it in gold. There you go. You heard it from Simon himself. It's been a fascinating conversation, Simon. And perhaps uh, if things start to escalate, as you and I might think that they do, I will reach out to you again. I'm sorry we won't see you here in Australia, but, you know, stay safe. And uh, thank you for all that you do and your deep research. And as I said, right at the start, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to read more about Simon's research, uh, go to Simon Dash, not dot, Simon Dash Hunt dot com. And that's Simon Hunt Strategic Services. He does a lot of good research, which I would urge all of you to start watching, reading, listening and stop watching Netflix. Kerry Stevenson, thank you so much <laughs> for joining me and Simon Hunt today on Making Money Matter. Well, thank you, Kerry, for having me. Great to chat again. Maybe we shouldn't wait for another seven months. We won't. I'm putting it in my diary. I, <laughs> you know, I can't believe it's seven months. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's like me. Like me. Mm. Well, for now, we'll get you back very soon. Super. Thanks for having me. Cheers. <laughs>